Thank you all so much um, for coming to our panel so about uh, fighting transnational sure repression of journalists. Um, we, um, I'm, uh, my name is Megha Rajagopalan. I'm a reporter with BuzzFeed News. Um, we have a, a really uh, star-studded group of panelists here today um, who work on a whole basket of different issues and are all very accomplished journalists and activists um, in their own right. Um, I'll just introduce them very quickly. Um, to my left here is Roshan Abbas. Um, she is the founder and executive director of the Nobel Peace Prize nominated campaign for Uyghurs Thank in you Washington, D.C. So um, um, and she's one of the most prominent Uyghur activists in the United States. States. Um, she Republican actually got her start as an activist, um, as a student leader at Xinjiang University, um, where she joined pro democracy protests as a student. Um, and when Radio Free Asia launched its Uyghur language service in 1998, which is still the only Uyghur language. Um, uh, broadcast publication um, outside, of, um, outside of the region. Um, she was the first Uyghur reporter broadcasting daily um, to the region by radio. Um, next to her is, uh, is Masi Alinejad. Um, she's an Iranian journalist, activist, and author of the 2018 memoir, The Wind in My Hair, My Fight for Freedom in Modern Iran. Among other things, she's the host of a television show on Voice of America's Persian language service. And she's covered a whole range of subjects and was a parliamentary reporter before as well. But she's best known, I think, for her campaign against the, co the, compulsory, uh, sorry, the compulsory hijab in Iran, um, which has included a number of social media campaigns, including her White Wednesdays campaign, which I hope we'll talk about in this conversation. And she was forced out of Iran in 2009 after years of threats over her reporting, which was critical of the ruling regime. And next to her is Jan Dundar, who is a Turkish journalist and columnist and an extremely prolific author of, I think, about 20 books. Um, he was the editor-in-chief of the center-left Cumhuriyet newspaper in Turkey until August 2016. Um, he was jailed for 92 days in the, the year before that, along with a colleague for reports on the interception of trucks bound for Syria that uh, belong, apparently belonged to Turkish intelligence. Um, and one of his most recent projects, which I also hope to talk about, is a publishing house in Germany that will specialize in publishing books that are banned in Turkey. Um, so I wanted to talk sort of first about, we, I want to talk both about kind of conventional media coverage and social media and also how we can kind of all work together, um, you know, between borders um, to protect journalists and create better journalistic work. Um, but I wanted to start first with John. Um, I was wondering if I could ask you a little bit about your experience of being arrested as a journalist. And I was curious uh, whether um, the kind of international attention that was brought to your case, um, but both by press freedom organizations and by international media, like what impact did that have on the case? And um, yeah, like uh, what were your thoughts about it? A lot, a lot of impact. Imagine yourself in a prison cell all alone in okay. solitary confinement and they are giving you daily paper, which is kind of censored or um, government control. But in the last page, a small news about yourself saying that Pan International or Reporters Without Borders is campaigning for you. You can't imagine the impact of it on you because you all, all of a sudden you realize that the world is aware of you and you are not alone and someone is taking care of you somewhere in the world. It's an immense, immense impact on a prisoner in suffering. And, and do you feel that in cases like yours where there are political, like in politicized cases, in um, maybe in Turkey in particular, which is a huge jailer of journalists, um, do you think that generally speaking more attention leads to better results or is there a balance that should be struck? Of course, I mean, more you get the attention of the world public, you are more secure, of course. And it's a kind of protection. And at the same time, it turned the, the prison turned into a kind of microphone for you mm. that you can, you know, um, nobody can listen to you if you are free, if you are a free journalist, but if you are in jail, then the world starts, you know, listening to you. This is ironic, but true. So, uh, thanks to my imprisonment, I had the, had the chance to explain the human rights conditions in Turkey. So, that's also important. But we should support those organizations like 
Penn, RSF, um, CPJ, they are all working for journalists in jail or under threat. Yeah. Um, and Roshan, I wanted to ask you sort of along similar lines. You've done so much work for years now campaigning on behalf of your sister. I was wondering if you could just talk a little bit about what's happening with your sister and then also like, sort of for you, what is the value of media coverage in this campaign for her to be freed? Um, like how, how can sort of the international media play a role in that? Thank you so much, Maya. Um, the Oslo Freedom Forum is uh, being the platform, actually, to talking about uh, China's genocidal policies, which started with you in 2018 when you took the stage and talked about the dystopian hell on earth, how the China was uh, conducting uh, the genocidal policies in our homeland. Uh, at that time, the world didn't know much about what's happening to Uyghur people. And then uh, 2018, September 5th in 2018, I spoke on a panel like this, was televised live at the Hudson Institute in Washington, D.C. Six days after that uh, panel, my own sister, a retired medical doctor, uh, she was abducted to punish me for my advocacy work in America as an American citizen. So basically today, I am speaking out. I am advocating for millions of Uyghur people who are being detained in concentration camps, imprisoned, long sentences for just being Uyghur, and as well as being modern-day slaves and making <coughs> products for most of the Western brand, and they are making this genocide a profitable venture. And I'm doing all that at the cost of my own sister's freedom. And I uh, talked about my husband's family on that panel. He's sitting among us. He has no communication with his family, 24 people from his family since spring of 2017. We don't know if my in-laws are still alive and where they are being held at. And the same for my sister. I don't know if she's still alive. She's a retired medical doctor which uh, you know, retired in an earlier age due to the health reasons, and I have absolutely no information. That's why it's frustrating for me when I don't see the genocide of the Uyghurs, which the Uyghur women's bodies becoming the battleground of this genocide taking place. The Uyghur women are facing forced sterilizations, forced abortions, forcibly inserting IUD devices on their bodies, the Uyghur children are taken away from their families, and the Chinese state media reported actually 1.1 million Han Chinese cadres moved into Uyghur homes, live inside of their houses, supervising and monitoring their daily lives while the husbands are all gone to the prisons or concentration camps or the um, uh, forced labor facilities. Uyghur women are facing sexual abuse in their own bed. Something like this never happened anywhere in the world, but where are the feminists? Where are the, the active voices who are supposed to defend women's and children's rights? When I look at the mainstream media, many of the politicians, and the so many uh, vocal celebrities, you know, famous celebrities who are so vocal against any kind of social injustice, when the perpetrator is China, and the perpetrator has the money and the power, they are all silent. That's why it's extremely important for international media to cover the story truthfully, rightfully, while China is spreading so much disinformation and the false narratives. It is very important to build that critical mass to stop this genocide. Yeah. Thank you. Um, and Masi, I wanted to ask you because you were, you were a you worked for a long time as a journalist within Iran, and then you're still doing this work now um, that you live abroad. And I'm curious if you could talk a little bit about the kind of differences between the two, and um, you know, have, have you felt that you can be more effective because of less censorship when you're abroad, or is it the other way around? First of all, I want to say hi to everyone, and thank you so much for coming, because I know that means a lot to all of us. And, um, Together, we are stronger. Thank you. Um, I have to say that when I was in Iran, 
I got kicked out from everywhere. Right. As a parliamentary journalist, I just exposed the corruption. I mean, if it was here, everywhere in the West, I would have received an award. My award was just being kicked out because I published the pay slips of the member of the parliament. Mm -hmm. So, personally, I don't have good memory, but I have to say that now the situation has changed. When I was there, um, social media was not that big and powerful. Mm -hmm. Look, now, I really want to actually use the opportunity and tell you that the main journalists are not those who are working for mainstream media at all. In my country, the main journalists are ordinary people. I want to actually give you an example. When Iran protests took place, all the journalists were silenced because, first of all, you cannot say anything. It's red line. <coughs> if you do, you go to prison. They kick out all the international journalists. There's some correspondents there from CNN. But I, I, I don't want to name. Some Iranian, some journalists from international media are there, mm. but they live on their own bubbles. Mm. They don't want to lose their connection with the politicians. So guess what they do? They go to the reformists, they go to the politicians, they actually um, write something about the narrative of the government. But in the street, you see that brave people they filmed the last moment of their life. We hear that one of the protesters say that, people, come to the street, let's get rid of the regime. And immediately, he got shot in the head in front of the eyes of his mother. And his mother became his voice right now. The regime actually said that, okay, you, I, I know you asked about my work, but I give you these pictures to tell you that. So when they make videos, they have to find the media. They send it to me. But the government made a law saying that the head of the Revolutionary, Guard, uh, Revolutionary Court went on TV and said that anyone sent videos to Masi Alinejad will be charged up to 10 years prison because they think it's just may maybe it's me. There are millions of people within the society and many activists outside Iran, the link between them now created a new journalism in my opinion. And if you want to actually hear the true voice of Iran right now, just go to social media. Just open your eyes toward the people within the society. So I want to finish with this. These mothers who lost their beloved one in Iran, I still get goosebumps when I talk about them. When they were told not to speak up, they took the picture of their beloved one. They went to the same streets saying that, this is the street that you shot my son. This is the street that you killed my beloved one. And now these are the, to me, these are the true journalists. These are the true media. They became their own storytellers while they know that this is a risk. As my sister mentioned, these people within the society with their own camera, which became their weapon, their mobile phone, now they are louder than the feminists around the world. They are louder than the journalists and mainstream media around the world. But as we see journalists in, in Norway, I mean, I have to say that it's a big shame that they invited Taliban here, and then you see the feminist female politicians bow to the Taliban wearing compulsory hijab. But in my country, Iran, in Afghanistan, thanks to brave through feminists within these two countries, they say no to compulsory hijab, they say no to Taliban, and to me, these are the true face of new media and new uh, feminism. That's all I believe. <laughs> Sorry. I know Norway is not going to invite me anymore, but I had to say that because <laughs> seeing that picture of female politicians wearing hijab in front of Taliban, it breaks my heart and the heart of many women inside Afghanistan. I had to actually use this opportunity. Thank yeah. you, Norway, for inviting me. <laughs> <laughs> you're, you're a very good speaker. Just one more for you. Um, I wanted to ask, I mean, you're a person with a huge platform, um, I think on, on any platform, really, but I, I really have to admire how you've used social media, I think, to expand the reach of your work. And I was curious if you could talk a bit about, like, what should the role of the platforms be for activists and journalists, like what is their sort of obligation to you? And, and also, could you talk a bit more about like what is the utility of social media for you? Yeah, I mean, 
Sorry, I used the opportunity to talk about those women inside Iran because honestly, yeah, honestly, yeah. this is, if it's my platform, I say that. If I have 8 million followers on my social media, mm. it's all because of those citizen journalists within the society. Yeah. And I have to say that Instagram is banned from Iranian people. So, but I have more followers than the Ayatollahs. <laughs> so you see, that's the power of... So this is, this, is, this is actually, that actually shows you a better picture of Iran. Mm. It's like the Ayatollahs, they have money, they have power, they have prison, they have everything. They have guns and bullets. But people, they only have their camera and they send their videos to me and I publish it. And recently I heard that Instagram moderator was offered by the Islamic Republic 10,000 euro to remove my Instagram account. So and I got in touch with Sheryl Sandberg three times, which I found out that my Instagram doesn't appear on the search. I mean, nobody could find me. And I was not able to go live on Instagram. I was shocked because people were getting killed in the street. They were sending videos to me. I have to say that it's not just me. I'm just one of the example. They did that to some mainstream media like uh, Iran International, like Manoto TV, like Iran, Radio Farda, and many other activists. There another like one known social media platform covering Iran protests. 1,500 people got killed, and this page is just covering the story of the families. So the Iranian government used the moderators in tech companies to censor us. So again, in the West, we think that we are safe, but the tech companies, instead of kicking out the dictators, they are actually removing some of the photos and videos of Iran protests. I still didn't lose hope, didn't lose my page. I'm fighting to actually for, for other people to get their Instagram page back. But I use my social media every day to tell people that, look, my government did everything to me to break me. They went after my family. They put my brother in jail. They brought my sister on TV to disown me publicly. They interrogated my mother. They even sent someone here to kidnap me. Everything you, th you think they did to break me. So and I tell myself every day, with my weapon, with my social media, I have two options. Feel miserable I make, or make my oppressors feel miserable. I choose second one. <laughs> <That's it. laughs> well said. Um, John, I wanted to ask you something a lot, kind of along similar themes. I mean, I think everyone here has probably felt the pressure of kind of transnational pressure, um, you know, from from the regimes that you might have escaped. And I was curious, like, I mean, I, if you could talk a bit about your recent project to publish ba books that are banned in Turkey and whether you felt any pressure from the Turkish government, either on that project or really on any of your work since you've departed. Of course. I'm just listening, uh, Masi and uh, Rushan. Uh, I was trying to imagine the immense of pain, even in this meeting, uh, and imagine this whole building. We sacrificed a lot. We lost a lot. I mean, our country, our freedom, our family members. Um, for what? For defending the truth, for freedom, for a democratic country. Or world, free world. So, of course, the price is so high, but um, now we are a family here. Uh, Turkish government is supporting China and uh, ignoring Uyghurs because they have interest there or they are scared. And Turkish government cooperating with Iran re regime uh, because they need good ties with Tehran. So. So this is not about Turkey, Iran, China, Norway. It's about dictators against freedom fighters. This is the tag of war between the two. So that's why we have to come together and support each other. And it's a good way, of course, my project was uh, kind of, there are censored books, banned books, banned articles in Turkey. So I'm trying to publish them because 20 years ago, it was not possible. But today, you can distribute it via internet for free. And you can reach your audience, your readers. And not only that, there are projects like Forbidden Stories, for example. Um, if 
your story is somehow forbidden or censored. Other journalists from different countries come together and work on follow-up your story, which is an international solidarity attempt, and also a very good journalistic uh, investigation. Uh, I guess we can only get rid of and cope with this censorship and oppression if we come together and work together, and that's the one way of supporting this. That's interesting that you brought that up. This is something I struggle with a lot, which is that you, the way that journalism works is sort of inherently competitive, and I think that that dynamic exists even between yeah. local journalists and international, and it, it is kind of um, in conflict, I think, with some of our, our aims. And I was curious if you could t talk a little bit, like how is it possible or how, how should we cooperate in a way that's more effective? Imagine Panama Papers. I mean, we came together, hundreds of journalists came together, and because all the dictators have a kind of uh, agenda or a kind of roadmap, and they are copying each other, they are collaborating with each other. So they know how to govern the country, how to run, uh, just seize the media, get rid of rule of law, defense parliamentary regime, and put pressure on people, uh, arrest the journalists and the rival politicians, etc. They have a kind of roadmap. So we should have a roadmap to cope with it because the, the attack against our freedoms are global, so we should just fight against it globally. And this collaboration, cross-border journalism, is so, I mean, shining nowadays, I guess. And we, are, we start finding each other, working together against our aggressors. And this is, I guess, this is the best thing we can reach so far in journalism, and I guess cross-border journalism is at the peak of it at the moment, and with Panama Paper we saw that we can really um, expose them, expose their uh, corruption cases if we come together and work together. And then, yeah, and I guess um, also for you, I mean, you've, you've published very extensively within Turkey, and then you've published outside as well, and I was curious if you could talk a little bit about um, you know, like in these kind of cross-border projects, is there is there more utility in publishing in, with, within a country where you're trying to create change, or is there more utility in publishing, um, you know, somewhere where censorship and, and blowback against journalists is less of a problem? Imagine my story was about Turkish intelligence service was smuggling arms to Syria, so it includes Syria. The the, the arms were coming from Ukraine and they were taking the arms from Serbia, and the uh, United States was kind of involved on, in those, all those... Pro pro and Canada, a, a group of journalists in Canada is searching for the trace of the arms shipment. So it's already a big, huge project. So now we are Canadians, Americans, Syrians, uh, Turkish journalists, Kurds. So we have a huge project, and we can expose the the whole war strategy of Turkey and Syrian regime, etc. So this is a very good example of how can we cope with the, our aggressors. And I guess if we can come together, we can uh, really expose them. And just today we learned that four, four billion people under uh, aggressive regimes, we are crowded. <laughs> it's a huge population. It's more than half of the population of the world. So we should do something together to you know, get rid of them. Roshan, I wanted to talk to you a little bit more about um, you know, this, this idea of pressure across borders. I, I think um, the Uyghur community knows this like, very, very acutely. Um, I was wondering if you could sort of explain like, like how does China put pressure on especially Uyghur journalists and other journalists who work on this issue and then put pressure on sources as well and what impact has that had on um, just the story coming out? Radio Free Asia, Uyghur Service is doing an amazing job covering the story, um, but uh, so many of them are paying the price of their family members are taking hostage. And also, as you mentioned, the people back home, they are being uh, hostage taken by the, the regime. The entire Uyghur population, they cannot speak out. Their phones are tapped, has a special app, so the government can track them. 
So it's extremely difficult to get any information out. But even with that, they are using everything they can to communicate with Radio Free Asia reporters and getting the little bit of video clip or some pictures out. So it's extremely difficult for the journalists to go and cover the story there. And we are seeing um, the front of everybody's eyes what happened in Hong Kong. And the, uh, also today, what we are watching, what Putin is doing in Ukraine, mm -hmm. that is an example of what happens when you appease the dictator. The world community, the world leaders are basically being manipulated by the Chinese government and the China is using the trade threats, manipulation in the United Nations as the second largest donor, and the power of the Belt and Road Initiative, and the debt trap diplomacy. Mm -hmm. China is becoming the power strong arm of the world today. So my question is, you know, for the people, for those um, leaders of our countries, here I'm sure we're having people from all different countries. Some of them are from Middle East, Muslim majority countries, some of them are from free Europe, the Western countries. You know, why our leaders are not speaking out? Why our corporations are not speaking out? Genocide should be our red line. There's no neutrality in genocide. Is there, there is... the perpetrator and the enablers. China is the perpetrator. Everyone else choosing the silence and those companies making profit off of Uyghurs' blood, sweat, and the tears, they are the enablers. And also those companies, those leaders of those countries, making all of us complicit. Because today we go out, buy things from those Western brands that we all love to use. We are all complicit because these companies are using Uyghur slaves for their supply chains. So when those leaders, we should ask our lawmakers, our leaders, our uh, uh, politicians, when they are voluntarily giving up their freedom of speech, they are not speaking out against China's genocidal policies. What does that mean? That's not just that they are giving up their freedom of speech, freedom of expression. They are giving up their sovereignty. China's in, actually. This is not something that's within their borders, and the uh, people are being harassed, taken hostages in, in East Turkestan or within China. It's in our parliaments, in our media, social media. Look at the Twitter. The Chinese officials are using the, the platforms like Twitter, YouTube, and the, uh, Facebook, attacking us, hmm. demonizing us. While the 1.4 billion Han Chinese people have no access to social media, why Twitter is allowing the Chinese officials to attack us and spreading this information? So when we have our academia are losing the freedom of speech, and that there are actually Western scholars speaking out for China and denying the genocide. There are three sets of Chinese government's own leaked documents, but we have the Americans or French or European academics sitting and the, uh, basically denying the genocide and defending China. What does that mean? So what the Chinese government is doing is not just the future of the Uyghurs anymore that's at stake here, you know. We, we have been crying out loud for years, since 2014, we have been trying to get attention from the West to help Uyghurs. So it's not just the future of the Uyghurs anymore. Now help yourselves, help those countries before it's too late, because China is in every country manipulating every country's systems, media, mainstream media are not reporting so many things that's happening to Uyghur people today. And the, look at the High Commissioner of the United Nations, Michelle Bachelet. She's in China today. But what happened to the Human Rights Report that we have been asking yeah. for past yeah. year and a half? Yeah. When China is conducting active full-speed genocide and sitting on the Human Rights Council in the United Nations, we are inviting the murderer to judge his own trial, basically. So, 
basically, the, the world system, the values, the rights that everyone takes for granted here in the West, and your parents, your grandparents worked so hard to establish last 50 to 70 years, that's being jeopardized by China today. So if we don't take action, not just to help for Uyghurs, but help to save this free world, then everyone should just look at the Uyghur peoples today and the picture tomorrow and the world that we are leaving behind for our children and for our grandchildren. Um. I want to return uh, to a point that you made about, like this, like social media. I think has been a really instrumental in bringing more attention to the Uyghur cause in particular. But that this issue is like, um, like the issues that you face around trolling, especially state-sponsored trolling from the Chinese government. I wanted to ask you about this, Masi, because I know this is this must be something that you deal with every single day. Um, like, w how has that sort of changed your ability to do your work? And then also, can you talk a bit about what, what would you hope the plant platforms would do oh um, in God. response? First of all, I want to say that when my sister was talking about how dictators are enjoying freedom on social media, I couldn't even breathe. How did you feel? Does it make you angry? But being angry is not enough. We have to take action. Write to your local media. Write to your local politicians. It's unbelievable. Taliban is enjoying freedom on social media. China, Ayatollahs, 18 million people are banned from Twitter. My people were getting killed just last week. People were getting shot in the chest, in the head, in my country. At the same time, Iranian government shut down the internet. They killed 1,500 people two years ago. If they were punished two years ago, they wouldn't dare to do it. But when the tech companies, the tech companies, I'm angry. And one time when I was furious, I saw the bloody like face of protesters in the street and I went to social media. I said, fuck you tech companies. Why don't you kick out dictators? My government shut down the internet right now. And some of the journalists from mainstream media complained my language. Can you believe that? They complained my language because I use F word. But they didn't say anything to kick out Khamenei, China, Erdogan, Putin, all these dictators. They must be kicked out from Twitter. And all of you, you remember when Gary Kasparov was warning everyone, saying that winter is coming. It's the title of his book. He was warning the whole world about Putin. When I got invited by Gary Kasparov to come to Oslo Freedom Forum for the first time, many left Democrat liberal warning me, he's warmonger, he's right wing. Don't go there. Don't appear with him. He has been ignored for years and years. Now war is here. We, the people of Middle East, we know war. We know the pain of Ukrainian people. Maybe you're new to this, but we carry the scars on our shoulder. We carry the wounds of war every corner we go. The people of Afghanistan, Syria, Iraq, Iran. So when you ignore people like Gary Kasparov, when you ignore my brother from Turkey, when you ignore my sister, when you ignore all of us who are fighting against dictators, then Dictators will come here and you have to challenge them on your own soil. When we don't end dictators, now, as you hear in Oslo Freedom From, they will end us. They will come after us. I always say that dictators are more deadlier than coronavirus. They will infect the rest of the world. Right now, I have one question and I'm going to leave you. You have to answer this question to me, all of you. If in your country, Women are not allowed to go to a stadium. Do you call this a normal sport? Or you ask FIFA to ban and boycott that country until the day that women are allowed to go? What would you do? You call FIFA or you say, let's just, you know, women cannot go to a stadium. It's okay, but men are happy. What would you do? Answer to me. No? 
But what is different between the women of Iran and the Western women? It has been 40 years. Women of Iran are not allowed to go to a stadium. But when we call FIFA to ban the Islamic Republic, here, Western feminists, Western media tell us, shh. If in your country, Muslim women get bitten up to remove their hijab, what would you do? You stand up in solidarity, no? But in my country, it has been 40 years. Women are forced to cover themselves. Western feminists, Western journalists, go in front of Islamic Republic and Taliban, they bow them and they cover themselves in the name of my culture, or they don't want to cause Islamophobia. Wait a minute. As a woman who grew up under Sharia law, I have the right to be scared of Islamism. And I'm not scared of you calling me Islamophobic, because you all should be scared of Taliban, ISIS, and Islamic Republic. Join us. Call international community. Do not legitimize Taliban. Kick out Islamic Republic and Taliban from everywhere. Because if it was the Western people suffering from this kind of regime, you would do the same. There is no difference between us. The blood of people of Afghanistan is not different than the blood of people of Ukraine. The blood of people in Iran are not different than the blood of people in the West. The right of women in Iran and Afghanistan is not different. Thank you. Sorry. I think that's a really that's a really good place to end this discussion um, with this idea of cooperation across borders and the idea that we should have the same standards for people for the rights of people everywhere and not just in our countries. Um, thank you once again to all three of our panelists. It was very very informative discussion. I really appreciate you being here. Sure. Thank you so much. Thank you all for coming. Thank you for coming. Thank you for coming. Thank you.